Okay, this chapter in chapter four is one of the most important in using uh, in getting ready for a lab. So experiment four uses the first half of chapter four and experiment five uses the second half. So this is something that you certainly want to pay attention to and maybe take really good notes about um, besides just like reading the text because you're going to be using it for your lab reports. Um, so first for Experiment four, we need to understand how to tell the difference between a combination reaction, a decomposition, uh, single displacement, double displacement, and combustion. Okay, mainly single displacement and double displacement. So just to remind you, single displacements have uh, a single element in them and they make another element as a product. Double displacements are just two compounds and you're switching the cations and the anions. We're gonna focus first on doubles. Um, and we'll look at single displacements a little bit later. You also need to have some skills in balancing chemical reactions. So that's part of experiment four. The at-home portion of it is going to be focused on interpreting the words, so that's naming, and writing a balanced chemical reaction. So hopefully you've watched those videos already. Uh, remember that when you're balancing the chemical reaction, when you're going from reactants to products to count your atoms don't mess with the subscripts only the coefficients can be changed if you change the subscripts you're changing the identity of the chemical and then of course from that chapter we learned how to use mole ratios to go from say how much reactant to the amount of product you can make stuff like that okay all of those things come into chapter four so i hope that you're keeping up with your videos okay and alex also so displacement reactions, okay, we call these double displacements or double replacements. Um, they form precipitate, and we talked before about the difference between a, a deposit and a precipitate. So deposit is what you get in a single displacement reaction where it forms on a surface, usually on the metal element that you put into, this, into the solution. That's different from double displacement, which forms powder throughout the entire test tube. It makes it look um, almost, almost like it's a liquid in a way until you've let it sit for a while. The way to tell if you have made a precipitate is to hold it up to the light and if you can't see through it, if it's cloudy at all, that's a precipitate. If you let it sit, it'll collect to the bottom eventually. It doesn't have anything to do with rain in chemistry labs. Um, precipitate kind of literally means like to fall out of something right so precipitation as in rain or snow is falling from the sky it forms on a piece of dirt and falls down from the clouds right um here the context is a little different we're talking specifically about an aqueous solution forming a solid uh, and it falls out of solution so that's the connection there anyway common misconception i wanted to address so we should be able to write these reactions at this point you should pause it and try it out um, I forgot my captions. Shoot. There we go. So you should be able to write these reactions by now. Pause it and give it a try and then come back to me and see what, what I do. So NO3 has a minus two charge and it says that the lead, is, I'm sorry, minus one uh, and the lead is plus two. So to get them to come together, I need two nitrates. Um, Oh, we actually haven't learned this yet. I'm going to erase this date. We'll get there. We'll get there by the end of the next couple of videos, right? So we'd, you probably put Ki, and that's fine. Then PbNO32, and it produces a solid. And so it's asking what the solid is. What is the reaction? How do you know what the solid is? And so if this is uh, a double displacement reaction, what I like to do is put the cations in one color. So let's make the cations purple. And we'll make the anions red, because I already did that. And so the positively charged things are purple. And so when you're doing a double displacement reaction, which means you have two compounds to begin with and two different compounds at the end, the easiest thing to do is, is just switch your cations, right? So, oops, I didn't switch. <laughs> uh, so if your K is written first, write the, write the PB first, but keep the anions in the same spot. So like this. 
right? And so our anions are going to come over. So the lead was attached to the nitrate, but now it's going to be attached here. And so that's a plus one on the periodic table. So I only need one of each. I'm not going to worry about that when I'm trying to figure out what the products are. I worry about it later. The K was attached to the I, but now the iodine is going to, the iodine is going to be attached to the lead. This is a plus two, and the iodine is in group 17, so we got to write it like that. Okay, then I'll balance the reaction. And so starting with the metals, we're going to do potassium. I have one on each side. That seems fine. Lead, I have one on each side. That seems fine. Iodine's next. I have two on the right and only one here, so i got to go two there, which means I have to make that a two, which actually helped us out because I needed two nitrates anyways. So there we go. That's our balanced reaction. Quick and easy. Um, so in order to figure out whether this reaction actually happens and what the state is, right? So it says there's a solid somewhere in the products. I don't know which one. We need to learn about solubility. So not everything dissolves in water. Okay, that's the bottom line of solubility. Um, and so if we take Ki, it's, it's what's called an electrolyte. So that means it's a salt. So when you put it in water, it's a soluble salt. So it's going to separate into K plus ions surrounded by water and I minus ions surrounded by water. The lead is also, the lead nitrate is also a soluble salt. Nitrates always are. Hey, what happened there? Um, so the lead ions and the nitrate pieces are separate from each other, floating around in the solution. So we have one clear colorless aqueous solution here and one clear colorless aqueous solution here. This is very common for double replacement reactions. The minute we pour them together, we get this this cloud of solid precipitate forming. And then after you let it sit for a while, it'll settle out. But in the meantime, it covers up the, the beaker, essentially. What we're seeing here is the nitrates are still dissolved. The potassium ions are still dissolved, but the solid is PBI2 coming together because the attraction between these pieces um, these molecules is stronger than its attraction for water. So that makes it insoluble. Insoluble means does not dissolve. Okay, so here we have NO3 and K plus that are dissolved ions separate from each other. And here we have a crystal structure, a solid powder of PBI2. So the point of this um, next couple of slides is to teach us how to tell them apart, right? So when you're in the lab, you want to make really careful observations of what you see in the beginning, any colors, any solid, anything like that, and what you see when you do the reaction, and then what you see after about 10 minutes. Okay, don't jump to conclusions because, well, sometimes we're wrong. Um, and by the way, solid, being a solid forming isn't the only thing that shows a reaction has happened. So here's how we know what which products are solid, which things are aqueous. All right, so we're going to look at Ki and PbNO3 first. So I like this solubility chart. You can find it online, but it's also in your notes. You just Google Flynn solubility chart, it comes up. So K is right here and I is right here. So they intersect here and it says green, which means soluble, right? SOL means soluble. When something is soluble, its state is going to be AQ. You should know, write this down, ionic things can only either be solid or AQ at room temperature. Don't tell me that it's a liquid. Ionic things are basically like a salt, right? Like salt from your table. You don't see liquid salt at room temperature. It has to be like in a furnace or a volcano to be that hot, okay? It would be molten if it were a liquid. So even though it looks like a liquid, you have to realize that's just the salt, the ionic substance, dissolved in water. Okay, so anyway, when it says SOL, that means aqueous. When it says insoluble, that means a solid. Okay, so we can keep going. So it's, it's lead and the nitrate is here. 
and it says soluble. And you'll see that nitrates actually tend to always be soluble. So if we want to get a metal to dissolve when it normally doesn't, like lead, we would put nitrate with it. Um, and this is wrong. This is insoluble. You should change that. Okay, anyway. Um, but the, or you can make an acetate with it, and that will dissolve as well. Okay, but anyway, in this case, the PbNO32 is aqueous. And then we reacted it with I minus, and so it says here insoluble. So that's why the yellow solid is PbI2. The K and so you also notice Ks are always soluble, nitrates are always soluble, so this is really soluble, so it's going to be aqueous. So what you want to do is take a look at this and look for those patterns, like that nitrates are always soluble, acetates are almost always soluble. Find what is always soluble, and, and including in the groups up and down, and make a list. Start by memorizing those things. If you have anything that's not on that list that you've produced, it's probably going to be a solid. Okay, because you're not going to have this solubility chart on your final exam. This is a tool for you to learn the patterns. But you want to kind of be going forward where you remember what dissolves, what doesn't. Um, here's a list. You can go through this and use this chart to help you figure out the answers. So for example, we already kind of looked at one of the group one elements, which is potassium, but in general, they're all soluble, right? So you can put a conclusion here. It's all soluble, which of course means that they're aqueous when they're reacting. All right, so find the general rules. So if you know what everything that is soluble and everything that is insoluble, you'll be good to go. Um, there's a few little exceptions too but you'll get used to those as you go along. Those exceptions become really important in Gen Chem 2. Um, so it's good, good to start learning those now. All right, so this is from your textbook and basically everything in uh, group one, the alkali metals and ammonium is always soluble. Um, I would also add here the acetates count. Basically these first three rules are always soluble things. There's very, very few um, exceptions to that. We're not going to talk about carboxylates at all in this class. That's an organic thing. Um, and this is just a quirky exception, so probably it's not going to come up all that often. This one is one of the interesting ones. So chlorine, bromine, and iodine salts are soluble except when you put them with silver, mercury, whoops, mercury, or lead. And this one also says copper, which is kind of unusual, but um, I haven't seen this in any other resource, and actually we do a lab in Gen Chem 2 that shows otherwise, so I'd actually cross that one off if I were you. But I do know chlorine or bromine or iodine will precipitate if you have silver, lead, or mercury present. And we're going to use this to analyze how much silver is in a piece of solder later in the semester. So this is an interesting exception that we can leverage. And then these are the um, things that are always insoluble unless any of the rules one through three apply. Okay, so that's what these exceptions say. So hydroxides are insoluble unless you have something from like group one or ammonium. Okay, so that's how you read this chart. You can use this chart as well to find the solubility rules as you need to um, to answer this chart or this list.